it is noon, so we will go ahead and get started in the interest of everyone's time. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Andrea Woodard, Senior Vice President of Government Relations and Public Policy here at the partnership. We, the partnership in collaboration with Capital Crossroads and the Young Professionals Connection, welcome you all here online and in person to today's conversation about the search for talent and the ongoing talent shortage. For those online, don't hesitate to put questions you might have in the chat feature. We'll moderate those at the end uh, based on the amount of time we have left. And for any in-person attendees, write your questions down, hold on to them until the end, and we'll make sure to have a, a, a robust Q&A session here at the end. The partnership works with the Robert D. and Billy Ray Center at Drake University on Show Some Respect campaign. And with that in mind, we always like to remind, uh, take a moment and remind everyone of the importance of civility in all of our events, our policy events. Advancing and meaningful conversation requires respect. And at the partnership, we urge all Iowans to engage in active listening and to be courteous as they express their opinions about issues. Together, we can have the tough conversations in a respectful way and find common ground solutions. As an organization, the goal of the public policy issue forums are to educate a broad audience on policy topics so that more of our members and investors and others can understand the issues and advocate to our elected officials. And for 2022, we have scheduled six of these public policy issue forums that will take place every other month on the third Thursday at noon. Our next one is scheduled for Thursday, June 16th, and we'll cover the topic of, of infrastructure. So, and I know Darby is going to share that in the chat for anyone online. Let's see here. Next, I want to uh, welcome Kathy. I have just a little bit of a page at my desk. So, you can introduce yourself. I, I'll, I'll let you do the, the, the bulk of it. I have one other thing I, I have here to mention. Each year, the Government Policy Council, which is our, our volunteer board, if you will, for the policy team, develops a state and federal policy agenda that we use then to advocate for each year. The partnership supports strategies to uh, address the existing talent shortages felt by many of, the, many of our members and investors, including continued and expanded effort and support for Future Ready Iowa initiatives, which I know you'll hear more about here in a minute, opportunities to engage untapped talent for the workforce, such as foreign-born and returning citizen populations, and then policies that ensure Iowa continues to be a welcoming place that is open for business. And that's some of the language that we have in our current policy agenda right now. So with that, I will turn it over to our experts to better dive into the issue by introducing our moderator, Kathy Leggett. Kathy serves as the Future Ready Iowa Policy Advisor at Iowa Workforce Development. And I will let you give more of an introduction of yourself and share a little bit more about Kathy. Okay, Thanks thank you. Here, thank you. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. Um, I, uh, as, as Andrea said, I'm the Future Ready Iowa Policy Advisor at Iowa Workforce Development. I've been in that role about four years, um, learned a lot, and continue to learn a lot. So I'm very excited to hear um, all the information that our panelists are going to share. Future Ready Iowa is Iowa's initiative to have 70% of Iowans in the workforce with education and training beyond high school by 2025. Um, and really, uh, I think that it goes much larger than that, and it's probably connected to almost anything anybody's doing right now. You know, we have five strategies. We, we work on funding. We want to uh, bring down barriers to individuals in Iowa to getting opportunities for education and training and workforce, work-based learning, grassroots efforts, and 21st century skills. So that's really hitting on pretty much everything uh, people are dealing with right now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. And so first we have here over here is Beth Niggett with EMC. Um, Beth is the executive, I'm gonna read because I wanna make sure I get it all right. Beth is the executive vice president and chief people officer at EMC Insurance Companies. She serves on the executive leadership team that creates the organization's multi-year strategic plan and has oversight of the development and execution of the organization's annual goals. She leads several teams responsible for creating people strategies aligned to drive business success, specifically in the areas of communication and marketing, corporate strategy, and strategic analytics, human resources, and innovation. So um, Beth joined EMC in 2010. Um, prior to that, she was general counsel for the Des Moines Independent Community School District, Iowa's largest school district. She provided legal guidance and counsel to the school board and district's administration. Beth previously was in private practice with the Bradshaw Law Firm over 
for over 13 years, where she focused on employment law, insurance, defense, litigation, and insurance coverage analysis. She grew up in Des Moines, received her bachelor's degree from Simpson College and her JD degree from Drake University. She serves on the executive board of the Greater Des Moines Partnership and is chair of the Talent Development Board and is currently on the board of directors for Iowa State Bank. So welcome, Beth. Yeah, and then what a great background to share your insights. So um, next I'll introduce Rob Denson in the middle with Des Moines Area Community College. Rob is the first native-born Iowan to be president of DMAC, born and raised on a small crop and livestock farm south of the Amanda colonies. From starting off in a one-room schoolhouse to being a semi-driver to college administrator to a trial attorney in Florida to president of Northeast Iowa Community <coughs> College and now DMAC for 19 years, Rob's been president. He is happy to be home and having such a great job. And then let's do Brad, yeah. <laughs> Brad um, with AARP, he's worked on campaigns and bipartisan causes for more than two decades. Since 2004, Brad has managed local, national, and international campaigns and assisted corporations and nonprofit organizations with management and public relations strategies to grow their brand, strengthen their bot, and strengthen their bottom line. Since 2015, Brad, Brad has led bipartisan efforts to address the issue of money and politics, worked with clients to strengthen the skills of America's workforce, and led Above and Beyond Cancer, an Iowa-based cancer survivorship nonprofit organization. In 2016, Brad co-founded Red America, Blue America Research, a bipartisan polling firm aimed at providing fair, accurate, non-biased polling to political, corporate, and nonprofit clients. And Brad has served as the AARP Iowa State Director since 2018. He lives in Des Moines with his wife, Lisa, two children, and a dog, Gracie. Gracie Carmel. Gracie Carmel. <laughs> okay. Gracie Carmel. All right, Gracie Carmel. So, so there you go, our really well-prepared um, Wealth of Information panel. So we're gonna thank them for joining us. And I'm gonna go ahead and start asking, we have a couple of prepared questions so that we can get the ball rolling. And then as we, we go through, we'll, we'll, we'll see what they have to say. And then at, and at some point we'll have time for questions from all of you and then those of you who are joining us virtually. So here we go. My first question is actually for Brad. We have some for everybody, but my first, and, and you, you guys can join in, of course, if you have something to share, okay? But um, Brad, specifically to you, the pandemic saw older workers speed up the pace of their retirement. I think we all saw that, had a huge impact. Is there an opportunity for those individuals to rejoin the workforce? Well, yeah, thank you for that, Kathy. So first of all, I think there's an opportunity for every Iowan in the state who's over the age of 18 to join, join the workforce. So I think this question, um, you know, needs to be probably put into context with, with, with some sense of just some demographic uh, information. So right now we have, in the next two years, we'll have about 25% of our workforce that is over the age of 55 years old. Um, and the reason I mention that is because in 1994, that number was 11%. And so if you look at just how dramatic that shift is in our workforce, you'll get a sense of kind of where we're at, but also you need to take into context looking at the state as a whole and looking at the country. And so one of the things I like to remind people is by 2034, for the first time in our U.S. history, we will have more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 18. Um, this has never happened before. Now, usually I have a slide deck where it shows from 1980 to current, and it shows the median age of every county, and it starts, and it's all clear, maybe a couple little light blue, um, and then by the time you get to 2020, it's completely dark blue, and almost every county has a median age of over 45. Uh, I can't do that because I don't have slide privileges right now, but usually it, it, it gets an audible gasp and everyone's like, I need a copy of that slide deck and I pass them out at the end. But um, the answer to your question is yes, older Iowans are finding opportunities to enter the workforce. Um, and it's a combination because of the low unemployment 
but it also has to do with inflation and the fact that they're struggling, a lot of older Iowans struggling to get by and inflationary causes are kind of pushing them back uh, into the workforce. The other thing is, I think employers more than ever right now are looking towards non-traditional uh, folks to kind of pull towards the workforce and older, older Americans and older Iowans fall into that bucket, along with like recently incarcerated, uh, incarcerated folks um, and, and other populations because they need to fill jobs. And so uh, I think older Iowans currently are in a good spot for being looked at, but the answer is yes, they are certainly getting opportunities right now. Is there anything, before we go to the next one, just I'm wondering based on that, is there any trend you're seeing that is like, this is what's really pulling them back in? You know, if, if, as an employer, if you're looking for workers and, and is there something you're seeing being very successful that you can share? Or is it just all over the board to say, to, to get some of these individuals back into the workforce? Well, I don't know. I mean, if you look at the numbers, if you see the, the number of people unretiring, so there's this number unretiring, okay. um, that number was, about 3.2% in February of 2020, which was higher than it had ever been. Then it dropped off a cliff, but as of today, it's right back at 3.2%. And so um, now there's a debate going on of whether unretiring is good or bad for the economy. Um, and the unfortunate reality is I think um, uh, most of the people today that are unretiring are doing so because of inflationary measures. Right. And um, they're in some ways being forced to force back to the work, but workforce. Thanks. All right. Rob, this one specifically for you. It is projected that by 2025, enrollment in higher education could decrease by anywhere between 11 and 15 percent. How can businesses prepare for this, the decrease in talent pool slash what are creative ways that businesses can continue to attract young talent, especially those who are not graduating from a two-year institution or a certificate program? Well, I think there's always going to be a, a lot of people in the school. It's a matter of how do we get to them. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that one-third of high schools, this is Iowa data, one-third of high school graduates right now are not going on to college for their education when we know that for most of the good jobs in Iowa, you need that additional training. Right. Even with 60% of the jobs in Iowa or more, requiring no more than a one or two year degree in specialized training to get into these jobs. I mean, in 2012 and 2017, the percentage of men graduating from high school going to college dropped 7% out of 54%. Women dropped 3% to 74%. I mean, in Iowa, it's crazy that we've got 33% of our high school graduates not going on. So we need to figure out how do we get to them and get them into a pipeline. And the solution is companies need to be more flexible. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I was driving a semi up and down the road. I mean, pity the other people on the road. But uh, we need to find opportunities for, and most of these high school kids need jobs. When I'm talking to even the school, the high school kids that are in current home with DMAC, almost all of them are working part-time somewhere. I talked to the Knoxville schools three years ago. 74% of their juniors and seniors are working part-time while they're going to high school. Yet, we have a hard time getting companies to be flexible enough to begin to attract these young people under 18. Yep. We, need, you know, we need them at least by 16 to give them opportunities. And our goal under work-based learning is to get them into a job part-time uh, while they're in high school or in college that relates to the major that they're seeking. First of all, it helps them learn more about what they think they want to do. But second, it gives the company an opportunity to really groom these individuals for a job that would, would be in their company uh, long term. Most of our students, or too many of them, do not have the kind of parental support that uh, helps them with a college going mentality. Uh, the Department of Education in Iowa is funding college and career transition counselors. I chair the, the governor's uh, STEM Council uh, Counselor Engagement Committee. Our current K 12 counselors are just slammed. They're, they've got twice the head count they should. And they deal with discipline, mental health, and registration. But what the state has done, and they understand that we need transition counselors. They're employed by the community college. They're not here to recruit for us. But for each counsel, transition counselor, we partner with two K-12s. Each K-12 puts in 25000 a year. I put in 30000 And they spend time just with juniors and seniors, helping them FAFSA and other career planning. Uh, so far, great success. We, we were funded for two. We've hired 10. 
uh, and just getting great responses from uh, the schools, but it's helping these younger people get into a pipeline. Uh, and, and, and right now, the MLK Davis Center for Working Families, which I hope you've all heard about at DMAC, uh, they do a summer youth program. Marvin Azir started this uh, when he was with the, as director of that center. For this summer, we've got 124 applicants. These are uh, kids uh, uh, beginning at age 13. We've got 55 kids age 13 and 14 that are looking for a summer job. 57 of the 124 are African American, uh, 29 are Hispanic. Uh, we're only we've only been able to place 25 because we're having a hard time finding companies that will make opportunities for these students. And I can tell you of the 25, a number of them are DMAC is hiring, uh, or the Parks Department or the city's hiring. When we really like to get them into the private sector to really see what what your business is like and, and what you're doing. So work-based learning, registered apprenticeships, I mean, work experience is critical. Uh, and the more flexibility your companies can have to, to hire into these high school kids and college kids part-time, uh, we know that the, probably one of the better work-based learning programs in the state is uh, AccuMoles program with DMAC. Uh, you know, we tried to fill our tool and die program. We, could, we should have shut down the program. Uh, we, we'd, we'd have a host, host an event. Even if we provided food, nobody showed up. Uh, AccuMold had one event, 40 people showed up, and our program has been full ever since. They work 20 hours a week at AccuMold, and I can tell you, uh, Marvin, uh, Roger Hargens and Grace Swanson would tell you that a lot of their evening shifts and weekend shifts are filled by BMAC students uh, working the tool and die. They come to us 20 hours a week. Um, Acumo pays for their technical courses, but then they spend a lot of time at Acumo and, and they have an unbelievably high capture rate. The number of individuals that stay there, because Acumo is a great company, and these individuals learn what Acumo is about. Shazam hires our second term IT students. Paid in, before the pandemic, they were paying 21 bucks an hour for a, for a year round part time job, and I'm sure it's higher than that now. Uh, of the 250 IT workers Shazam has, 144 went through our program, and our 144 pre pandemic were averaging $90,000 a year with a two year degree. I mean, you, you've got it. I'm telling companies, come partner with us and help us create a solution for you where you can help somebody get a part time job in your company. And nearly every one of our majors has some relevance to most companies in, in central Iowa. Uh, that is the best way to get ahead of the game uh, on this particular pipeline. Yep. Thanks, Rob. I, I just, a, a couple things I want to say on that is summer youth internships. So Future Ready Iowa um, is a yep. funder of the, the program that Rob talked about. Also, um, what, what I want to say is what we found over the last couple of years, last year and this year, we had a lot of applicants. We had over 158 employers who participated in one way or another with those summer youth um, uh, participants. And many of the employers have said, um, wow, I wish I would have done this sooner. Many of them have hired part-time or full-time the youth that they had, or they're going to go on to school and they're coming back in the summers. Um, so there's benefit to both sides, but it's it's territory that I think is, is not um, known to a lot of employers and the liability issues get people concerned. And so um, reach out. I've got people who've done this. We're going to actually host a webinar coming up in next week in the two weeks of our summer youth internship, some of those programs. And employers are going to be on there to answer. How did you handle liability? Why did you do this? How much did it cost? So there's support for you if you're considering doing that. So I just wanted to put, point that out um, quickly. And then now we'll move to, to Beth. All right. What are the current struggles of finding talent in a gig economy? And what are some of the strategies that business leaders can use to adapt to this? So I think we could spend all day <laughs> on all it, these yes, topics. Yes. And um, what I what I do want to just start off with is I, I think Kathy to your point and, and Brad and Rob two years earlier, none of this is in a vacuum. And so the more that we can look at this from a talent perspective in a very holistic way from a community perspective. So thank you to the partnership for hosting this, this round table, but then also with our community colleges, with our four-year colleges, with all of the foundations and um, how we can bring this together because talent is an imperative for all of us, for our businesses, for our schools, for our communities, you know, that rising tide raises all boats. And so I, I think it is absolutely imperative 
that we're all looking at this issue from that standpoint of how do we come at this in a very multifaceted way. And so the challenges, um, and for, for all of us, um, especially with this kind of a gig economy, um, and, and I'm not going to purport to indicate that, that we have all the answers to the silver bullet, and I would say that anybody who thinks that they do um, is wrong. <laughs> because it, it, it is so varied. But one of the things that we're seeing more and more of is inflation and how that has significantly impacted um, jobs and the economy. Um, from that perspective, flexibility, uh, and especially you know, in the pandemic and even coming out of the pandemic. Well, what have we learned is that you can do a job at all. You can do so many more jobs remotely than what we otherwise would have thought. And with the pandemic, a lot of organizations did have to shift essential um, crew, essential workers were on site, but so many positions were able to be fulfilled and fulfilled well remote. So what that means is the... Uh, the nation is your marketplace. And so we've got um, employees from EMC who have left and now they're sitting in Des Moines, Iowa, but working in Chicago or in New York or in Dallas. Now, likewise, we've picked up talent that is sitting throughout the, throughout the country, um, but it goes both ways. And again, going back to strong communities, you know, we want people also in our communities. Um, so that flexibility is a double-edged sword in terms of the, uh, the challenges that it creates. But then inflation, um, people leaving jobs because they can go elsewhere and make $15,000, $25,000 more. Some organizations are just you know, throwing, throwing dollars um, at, certain, at certain roles. And at some point in time, though, that pendulum is going to swing backwards or more towards the middle. And then what do you do? Because salaries and inflation are not, they're, they're not interrelated. Um, if that were the case, you know, our, our merit pay increases um, over the past several years when inflation was incredibly low, you know, we still had merit pay increases. And so in today's economy, where inflation is upwards of 7%, merit pay is not matching that. Um, so employees tend to be going where a little bit more of that bright, shiny bobble and what they're finding, what we've actually seen with, them, um, with our company is we've had several employees leave and just between January and March, we had 12 of them come back. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, less than a month later because grass may not be greener. And then so now we're being more intentional about what's the value of take-home pay. So we think about strategies to try and keep good talent where you know, within, our, within our doors having the conversations about what does that total rewards package mean? What's the value of take-home pay? Maybe you can go to a competitor and making $10,000 more in your base pay, but what's their benefits package look like? Are you paying more for medical? Do they have a, the same level of 401k? And what we hear a lot of times is, oh my goodness, everybody's got medical. Everybody's got a 401k. Well, but you know, that's not apples to apples because is that 401k match the same? Is it a high deductible plan? Or is it more of a um, robust medical plan that, that has you know, a lot more to offer for the premium that you're paying? So it is incumbent upon employees to really dig deep and look under the hood in terms of what is that benefits package and what does that mean? That's one of the reasons why we've had some employees come back because then they realize, oh my goodness, that ten dollars to $15,000 increase to my base pay didn't come close because I was making less from a take-home pay because I had no idea what my benefits package meant here. So having the conversations about what, how valuable is that, that uh, total rewards and that benefits package in addition to the competitive salary. The other strategy, you know, I mentioned earlier flexibility. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about you know, flexible flexibility mm -hmm. um, and this hybrid approach. There is absolutely value to um, team camaraderie and, and working together and being um, not being in isolation, but being able to be in a conference room where maybe you're whiteboarding, you're brainstorming, what value does that bring? But what that means then is if you're going to require that a team or a department come into the office, maybe not necessarily working full time in the office, but then what's the intentionality? What's the purpose? So purposeful work, meaningful work, and being intentional about that. And I think 
one of the things that we're seeing is this is creating a different toolbox for leaders. That toolbox from a leadership perspective of um, years ago, kind of this command and control and kind of do as I say, maybe not as I do or as I say so, that isn't going to apply because people see through that BS, I'm going to say. Um, and so it's very intentional. What are your values? Um, having a conversation earlier um, with what's the reason that your business is in existence and is everything that you're doing tethered to that? Because again, people see through that and employees want meaningful work, purposeful work. Does it add value to the organization? Do you stand for something more than the almighty dollar? How can I be a part of something that is meaningful? And so a lot of these strategies and a lot of companies have been doing this, but it's giving that intentionality and perspective and talking about that and being transparent and sometimes being vulnerable to say, we don't have the answers. And so we want to learn from you. What are you, what are you thinking? What does it look like if you've got several different teams in any organization and not having it, um, not having everything cut from the same cloth, but giving flexibility in an IT area? Maybe it's a little bit easier for folks to work remote and, and um, have additional um, remote and flexibility in that area versus some other areas where maybe there's more of a reason to be in person. But having that discussion, having that understanding, getting input and voice from your employees so that you can come up with solutions together as opposed to an edict or a mandate, because I don't think those typically go well. Um, no one likes to be said you will or you won't. We've seen how that goes over. And from a work environment, it's not going to be any different. Um, so I think from a standpoint of leadership, what culture are you creating, yep. having that flexibility um, and being very intentional about that. Again, that's a lot to unpack and a lot of nuances within there, but broad overarching things are some, yeah. some things that we see really helpful. Helpful. Yeah, to be intentional about. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, uh, let's see what else we got here. This one is going to go to all of you, so I'll just uh, read it and then I'll pick one of you to start with, okay? Um, we're going to say, what impact do retirement plans, this is a little bit on what you just talked about, Beth, um, retirement plans have on attracting talent and how does this vary by generation? So that's an interesting twist to that. How can businesses use retirement benefits and other benefits as tactics to attract talent? So you described that a little bit already, Beth, is trying to make sure people understand that package beyond just take home, comp, you know, pay. Um, what else would our panelists add to that? You know, the one thing I can just jump in and share sure. from a standpoint of even retirement benefits, mm -hmm. because one of the things that we would often get, so um, at EMC, we still offer a pension, mm -hmm. a fully funded pension, which is fantastic. And yes. not a lot of companies will offer that kind of a pension. Well, initially the response may be, hey, I'm not gonna retire from your company, so why do I care? Why do I care if you offer this pension? It doesn't matter to me. Well, let me tell you why you, you should care and why this is absolutely a benefit. Yes. If you are in our organization for three years, you're fully vested. And so it's like you're getting a bonus that you don't have to do anything for. It's not time to company results. We put money into an account, and if you stay with us for three years, you get to take that account because you're fully vested. And so even if you're with us for three years, there's absolutely a value to that. So again, it's that communication and articulating what that value is. And so I absolutely think that there, no matter what your benefits package is, whether it's retirement, tuition reimbursement, um, whatever benefit package that you're offering, no matter where somebody is in their life journey, whether they are 55, 65, or 18 and coming in, immense value in being able to articulate what that value means to them at their stage. Yeah, I, I would, I think that's such a good point on the, on the age range, because I remember when I had my first job, it was out of college, and all I had to do was check a box, get healthcare, because it was fully covered, and I didn't for three years, because I was like, I'm not going to, why do I need healthcare? Why do I need healthcare? And no one took the time to explain to me what, why you would even need this and why you should match your 401k. So I think explaining to the younger, I think, you know, sometimes 
we overthink the difference between older workers and younger workers. And this is more of a broad point, but it's one where everyone thinks like the millennials want the bean bags, candy, and older workers want healthcare. And that, that, is, that is not necessarily the case. Um, I mean, I like bean bags and I like my healthcare, right? So, um, but I think they, they want communication from management. They want communication from HR. And then to your point, they want to feel respected and feel like their work is valued. Um, now, the difference between, for example, you talk about meaningful work. I think that that definition is different for older workers and younger workers, because I think some, for some older workers, it may be more meaningful to be a mentor um, and to be given a project like leading a team or something, whereas maybe for a younger uh, worker, it may be defined as meaningful to really hear feedback from a manager or something. Um, but nonetheless, everybody wants meaningful work. Um, the last thing I'll say, because I think when you talk about benefits in general in 401ks, we are now talking about flexibility. And this was not even a part of the benefits conversation two years ago. Um, and I'll give you a very specific example. We recently tried to hire uh, for a role at ARP Iowa here. And I had the typical conversation with all of the applicants about their benefits, about the healthcare, about the 401k, the match, everything. We could not fill that role because of we were not able to offer a flexible work arrangement. It took months. We were offering benefits and compensation above the market range, yet it took months to fill that role. And it wasn't until we were able to offer flexible work um, where we then we then had a number of people accept, and then we finally had our choice. And so this, this conversation about flexibility is so new. Um, and I think we're all kind of trying to figure it out. Um, but I think there's, we need to take that into account when talking about benefits as a whole for all workers of all types. Good point. And the people we talk to, salary is number one, flexibility is number two, health is third, fourth is the vacation and leaves of all the various kinds. And then retirement discussion comes in fifth. And so we've got to check all those other boxes before they really even care about it. And then that's kind of irregardless of age. Because okay. everybody, you know, nobody knows how long they're going to be anywhere. And they just want to get in and say, how do I uh, meet all my needs for year by year? Mm -hmm. And then the retirement's got a cherry on the cake. Okay. Very good. Anything else to add to that conversation? You know, the only thing I'd add from a standpoint, and this not to retirement benefits, but benefits in general, mm -hmm. um, I was listening to um, a presenter a few weeks ago, and I can't remember if it was um, Gartner or McKinsey. Uh, but what they were talking about is, again, um, getting that feedback you know, from, from your employees um, and, and really listening. And this is, you know, it, it comes to the caveat because certainly no organization can be all things to all people at all mm -hmm. levels. And, and it goes to that fact, I think, of the, you know, knowing who you are, what your company stands for, which value proposition was what works within that, those parameters. But from a perspective of, all right, maybe there's low hanging fruit that we haven't thought of and, and how can we be creative? And this individual is throwing things out, um, you know, in addition to your um, maybe wellness reimbursement, but things such as um, what if there was a stipend for um, house cleaning? Mm -hmm. You know, are, are there are there folks that are, you know, would your employee base take advantage of something like, you know, house cleaning, um, meal prep, mm -hmm. um, things such as, you know, a caregiver reimbursement. So, again, knowing who are in, in your employee population, what's important to them. And it just it got me thinking that, wow, there's probably a lot out there, you know, just from that standpoint of um, opportunities. And then yesterday I was at the Global Insurance Symposium and just listening to some of these startups and what their, what their perspectives are, a lot of it is with even benefits offering. Mm -hmm. There was one on a rainy day. You know, what might that look like in terms of your benefits platform to provide reimbursement for a rainy day? Motor vehicle, yes. you know, things of that nature. And so there's so much out there, I think, that we don't even, haven't tapped into. Right, right. Um, that it's, 
the more you learn, the more you learn you don't know. And there, there's a lot out there. And I think that we could be seeking out that information, listening and learning. And might also really resonate because just a few years ago, flexibility mm -hmm. was not necessarily in that top two, <laughs> top three. Mm -hmm. And look at where we are now. So just being open mm -hmm. to what some of these um, opportunities look like for us. I think that's great. I think the creative creativity of that is great. And 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 yes, I think it seems like for so long we were in this this trajectory of this is what benefits looks like, you know, and, but boy, it's really all opened up. So I, some great, great examples there. Um, our next question is, it, it, it talks a little, I mean, benefits can be part of it and the di different generations. So as you said earlier, things kind of tie together, but our next question is how can business leaders retain their employees in the ever-changing technology, um, technologically advanced workplace where there are five generations to cover? So some things, you know, we already talked about some, some things maybe are different among generations, other things are, but go ahead and take that question a little bit further. Rob, do you want to go? Yeah. I think it's all about the supervisor. I mean, we, we know, and they say, you know, people don't leave jobs, they leave supervisors. I mean, and so we need to work, and, and this is something we're focusing on, how do we give our supervisor better people skills and supervision skills, and not only knowing where they're uh, People they supervise, what their goals are long time and long term, and making sure they've got professional development, whatever, whatever. Uh, but it's how do we make them better supervisors? And that doesn't mean you don't hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, you, if you're treated well and you like your workplace and you feel like you're being fairly handled, you why would you leave? Right. And then and you've got to keep pay and benefits. That's just a given. But it comes down to the people. Mm -hmm. And we especially see that now. Right. So what, what else? Yeah, I, I would add um, one thing that is enormously helpful, at least for me, is our surveys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one and this is um, this is fresh in my mind because two hours ago I got the results of our survey. <laughs> um, and one of the interesting things that came out of that was uh, number one is that people you know, felt very valued um, and they believed that their work was important, which was great. There was some great feedback. But one of the, one of the things um, that we need to work on is people that had been there for a long time um, felt a little stuck, you know? And so that was kind of interesting. And I think that is clearly a direct result of the pandemic because they you know, were just now kind of getting back to in the workplace uh, but for two years, people that had worked at ARP for over maybe 20 years, um, all of a sudden were totally isolated for two years and they weren't able to do their job the way they normally did. And I can imagine how frustrating that was. So now my question is, OK, well, we learned that from the survey. So how do we um, talk to those employees and kind of really get them back into a place where they feel energized again? Um, and that's going to be something I'm going to be working on. But, but surveys and, and, and we're. We're very good about that as a culture, and I think that goes um, at all age groups appreciate mm -hmm. that type of feedback. Yeah, and, and I would agree. And um, Rob, I love what you said about that when you look at the supervisor or that manager, and that doesn't mean you're not going to hold people accountable. And I think that is that is critical because the, again, the more we can look at this in a both and mm -hmm. kind of way, as opposed to the one size fits all or kind of zero sum, but what's in our toolboxes? And I'll go back to that from a standpoint of how we're leading, how we're managing. Um, and, and yes, with five generations in the workplace, and I'm, I'm going to put myself in there that I, I used to think that I was kind of um, up to date technologically and boy, I'm not necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I find myself, we just um, got a new phone system that will come through our laptops and I've got my, you know, the new device on the desk. And I look at that, and I'm like, wow, that kind of scares me. And how do I jump in and make sure I can use that? You know, so it's, it's that fear. And any time that there is change, there is that fear of the uncertainty and having to learn something new. And then once you go down that road, you realize, okay, that really wasn't that bad. But that fear of the unknown, and but recognize that. And it's okay. And if we can just understand that, there is that fear, there's a constant change, but that doesn't mean that's going to, when we say embrace change, mm -hmm. 
whether it's technology or anything, that doesn't mean that, that we no longer have the fear of what that change is. How do you recognize it? How do you manage that? How do you give your, your team the support that they need? And I'm going to go back to meeting them where they're at, having those conversations, creating that toolbox of resources so that, hey, if you're uncomfortable, that's all right. Let's work through this. Let's figure out what this technology is. Some people love Zoom. Some people hate Zoom. Having been on Zoom, you know, for the past couple of years, all day, every day, if I never have to see myself on a Zoom mm-hmm. screen again, that'll be all right. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> so you but you adapt. And I think it's this understanding that this is hard and it's a struggle for some folks in the workplace. Mm-hmm. Others, it's much easier. Then on the flip side, those different struggles are going to hit people differently. And that is okay. Mm-hmm. But we're going to meet people where they're at. We're going to communicate. We're going to come at this in a caring, empathetic way that is not mutually exclusive, be results oriented, accountability. In fact, when we take that, I think, more caring, mm-hmm. inclusive approach, mm-hmm. we're going to get better results. Hey, I want to definitely get to this next question, but before we do, one thing that I was thinking about while you all were talking about benefits and different, you know, the creativity and stuff is childcare, because that's a huge issue right now across our state and in a lot of other places. It's an issue that takes people out of the work um, workforce, but also makes it a challenging because sometimes um, if your childcare is not available that day, then that's the day that you don't go to work. Um, so it affects everyone. And the Iowa Women's Foundation is a great resource, but she was talking about surveys because you mentioned surveys. So they have surveys for employers to utilize to, to survey their employees on the child care issues so they can actually see that's one of the things that they suggest is we maybe think we know what the issue is or maybe we don't, but do a survey, you know, go to the next step and figure out specifically how these issues are affecting your employees because then you can maybe take some strategies to move forward. So that's one issue too I wanted to add to that conversation. So next, what are some identified or unidentified untapped talent communities and how can business leaders reach them? Um, So that's what inclusive policies are necessary in order to retain employees and foster a healthy workplace environment for all, which again, we kind of tagged that. You really just set that up for us, Beth, because you were talking about that. But um, yeah, what are those identified and unidentified untapped uh, talent populations? Go ahead. Well, I think older workers, uh, in my totally biased opinion, um, I think are um, potentially unidentified and untapped for a lot of companies. Uh, Veterans, disabled workers, previously incarcerated, I know um, that currently the Department of Labor and the EEOC, the Equal Employment, Employer uh, Employment Opportunity Commission has launched the Hire Initiative, which is basically um, meant to help companies come up with recruitment strategies to tap into these populations. Um, So I think there are clearly untapped populations out there. Good to hear the federal government is going to come up with some support to help people tap into that. The one thing you had mentioned is, is childcare. And I would also offer caregiving in, in general. Mm-hmm. Yes. And yep. it, you know, what's kind of interesting is people think of caregivers as, as women in their 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. And um, that is just simply not the case. Every, every, you know, there are potentially caregivers in this room. Um, there are caregivers uh, around 39% of caregivers are men, for example, 23% are millennials. Um, and so when we think about caregiving, it is really important that if people ha- need a day off to go take care of a loved one, that they have that. Um, and of course, you know, we're supportive of paid family leave. It's something that has been considered at the federal level. Um, it was in Build Back Better for a while. It's, I don't know where it is right now, but it's something that I think, you know, we're the only country with, with, uh, with um, an advanced economy that doesn't have paid family leave, and I think that needs to change. You mentioned prisoners. Uh, we've had a very extensive prisoner education program for Mitchellville and Newton based on the amount of money available, which is never enough. Uh, the Department of Corrections says that they come out of either one of those prisons with one of our certificates or degrees. Recidivism is 9% as opposed to 29%. The good news is, as of fall of 23, uh, we'll be able to use Pell for prisoners. That's kind of the phrase. 
and we're going to be we're, we've already got the structure in place to really maximize because right now 5,000 prisoners are released back into their communities every year about 1,500 come into the central Iowa uh, and every, all the experiences we've had, that we've had have been pretty doggone good so we have applied for an accelerator on that I mean we're ready to go tomorrow uh, so we're hoping that we get a, a, a waiver much earlier than the fall of 23, but that's one. The, un, the All these high school kids that are graduating from high school but don't go on to school or go on to college, that's a population. We've got a lot of diverse groups out there. Our urban campus serves about 5,000 students a year. It's the first majority students of color college or university in the state of Iowa, something we're very proud of, and we're doing a major expansion there. But the, the, and that's one of the reasons you and I has come to that campus in order that they can improve the diversity of their teachers that they generate, et cetera. Uh, immigration, I mean, business should just be screaming for better immigration. We should be the state that anyone from Afghanistan, Ukraine, or south of the border wants to come because we've got a plan. If we had a plan, you know, get them here, deal with the ESL issues if you've got them part-time work while they're getting specialized training, but we've got the jobs. Uh, and if we don't do a better job of bringing more people to Iowa by whatever means we need to do it, uh, we're gonna be behind. Um, in addition, just to echo everything, again, going back to what I said earlier, it's multifaceted and, and for this talent pipeline, it takes looking at every available resource and opportunity. Um, one of the things that we're also taking a look at again with our flexibility um, and able to recruit from all over, uh, we're looking at historically black colleges and universities mm -hmm. um, as, as a great pipeline. How do we bring people into Des Moines, into this community? We've got a great story to tell for our, for our community. And, and so getting folks here and, and exposing them and having them experience Des Moines, our environment and, and everything we have to offer is a really great thing. So looking at that as well as, you know, Absolutely, with our colleges and universities and internships, then going deeper into high schools. Mm -hmm. And so how do we partner with um, our organization has got a relationship with the East High School, mm -hmm. where we're trying to get folks interested in insurance, because who wouldn't want to go into insurance? It's an awesome, right? awesome industry. <laughs> so uh, letting folks yes. know what there is, you know, and not just for insurance, but in all of our um, private sectors within, you know, within the um, community. How do we get folks interested? And whether it is coming in to be in claims or underwriting or actuary, what about in facilities? So what would that look like? So it's one of those areas where we've got something for all areas, but again, going to how do we partner together? Um, because it it's, can't be done in a vacuum. I want to say two, two quick things on that. Um, some of the, the populations, all those populations you identified, um, on uh, Ryan West's um, podcast, we have, and you can get it through the IWD website, he talks to employers who have engaged successfully every one of those populations that are mentioned. So if you're looking for how did somebody specifically do that, I think that's a resource I just want to make sure that people know are out there. And the other one I want to mention, too, is, um, and we're speaking flexibility, is the Iowans with Disabilities, because we have, they are sometimes the, the, the prime um, target audience that is ready, willing, and wants to work, but needs an opportunity. And a lot of times it, ha it has to do with flexibility. You know, maybe they can't work a 40 hour week because of what, whatever they're dealing with, but maybe they can do a 20, 20 hour. So if you can split, just thinking creatively, creatively about how you can engage that population too, um, then I think we have it well covered and, and make opportunities for everyone. Do you want me to stop now or do you want me to ask my what this what I'd like to do the question if we can? I am good yeah. either way. Okay, what all right, because I think it's question? it's kind of brings it all together. So um, one last question before we go to the other other questions is what creative policy changes either at the state or federal level would help grow the talent pool? So state or federal level, and then also um, a caveat uh, internal policies. Um, that your, your companies may be considering or have done that um, that do the same thing, help help recruit and retain. Uh, have I mentioned flexible work arrangements? Yes, <laughs> I think that seems to be a key. Yes, okay. yes, okay. yes, yes, exactly. Uh, they should do that. Um, and uh, paid family leave. I mean, it's, it's something that I think would make it much easier for uh, certainly older, uh, older workers to uh, enter the workforce and 
My last thing is if, if you can figure out how to make 18 year olds interested in insurance, <laughs> one of my jobs is to make them interested in social security. So uh, oh, yeah. let me know how that works. <laughs> Very good, Rob. Well, I, I think we've got to deal with this immigration issue. I mean, most, so many people all over the world want to come to America and they should want to come to Iowa. So federal government in Iowa, we need to figure something out so that we can attract and make uh, and easier for the best and the brightest. You know, we've got the DACA kids. I mean, that are you know, we've invested a lot of them already. As so let's not put a barrier in front of them getting into a job, so that we get a, nothing else. We get a return on our investment. Uh, so I think I think that's uh, got to be Iowa's number one priority. Um, I would echo that and say, from a broad theme, policies that are inclusive, mm -hmm. that recognize the need for us to be inclusive, to be welcoming. Um, because that is going to help all of our organizations and our communities. So the paid leave, immigration, um, taking a look internally at, at any organization's own policies, really digging into the data, who is the user of those policies. Perhaps it was intended to be more inclusive, but the data shows it's only um, benefiting a particular group. So then surveying and how do you create a more inclusive offering for your benefits that can allow every employee, prospective employees to see that, hey, this organization understands my needs and is supportive of them. Very good, great, great. Okay, um, thanks so much. Now I think we can open it up to questions here. Does anybody have a question in the room? We'll start with in the room that they would like to, to ask. Looks like there is one online. Okay, then let's do that. Um, okay, the question is, is there anything employers can do to make sure these changes that are positive for employees are permanent and not rolled back once the labor market loosens up? It is awfully hard to go backwards. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, look, some companies have tried two-tier arrangements when the economy changes. Very, very difficult. This is the time of the work. I mean, if you've got a skill now, you've never been had better opportunities. And if you need a skill, you've never had better opportunities to get the training uh, under last dollar scholarship and many other funding sources. So, uh, you know, you can't guarantee it's not going to happen, but it's very difficult for a company to go backwards. And quite frankly, anybody who tries, uh, there's usually somebody else waiting to hire that person. I will say there's there's uh, there's some there's some responsibility on behalf of the worker to make it work. Too. Um, and, you know, the biggest, the biggest challenge for us during the pandemic was communication, internal communication, um, and those water cooler conversations that, you know, we all um, used to dread and now we look forward to again. Um, so I think there is a responsibility on, on, on the part of the worker to make sure that the employer knows that the changes that have been made regarding flexibility are working and that in, in that he or she can still be productive. Um, and it's of course part of the responsibility of the employer to recognize also that it's that it's working as well. Yeah, and I think that um, so thank you for whoever asked that question because I also think it goes to why some organizations most don't turn on a dime. And so those organizations that are implementing these types of changes to, um, to have sustainably um, effective hybrid work models, they're doing that with an investment of resources to make sure that that is a sustainable model. Um, compensation and, and salary ranges. You know, and that's exactly why you don't see most organizations. So when inflation goes up 7%, 8%, that all of a sudden, um, salary ranges or base pay commensurately and immediately goes up that, that, that same level because it has to be within the bounds of fiscal prudence and good budget and business acumen. It has to make sense. So most organizations that are entertaining and implementing these types of changes are doing so with the mindset of how do we make sure that they are sustainable ongoing. Well, yes, we, we have, have one last question. Okay, all right, um, online. All right. Um, so it was mentioned sourcing from HBCUs is the tactic for recruiting untapped talent. 
How have you tackled working to retain those employees when they arrived at Moy? Many Black residents who have domestic, domestically migrated have shared the struggle of how to find a community or a sense of belonging that reflects their identity. Um, so this person is curious how the organizations are tackling this. Um, so recruited employees are not leaving shortly after they arrive with claims of not being able to find a home in Iowa. So, so that's an excellent question. And I think that absolutely gets to the need for um, inclusion and that belonging within the organization, within the community, within our state, and recognizing that those are very real issues. And so, for example, whether it is where do I get my hair cut? What realtor do I use in terms of finding a home in this area? Um, those are those are aspects that we need to be be able to authentically um, to answer and to work with uh, employees so that when they do come to Des Moines, we are welcoming and from a standpoint of not minimizing the difference, but recognizing that differences make all of us better and add value. And that's where it's the diversity with the value add. And we want to make sure that we've got that environment where we can welcome those in, embrace that, and make sure that it is that belonging. And we see you, we hear you, we understand that what is needed for somebody, a white female, a white male, is going to be different than a person of color um, or an immigrant, whatever those life means are. So again, it goes back to what are the needs and meeting people where they're at and, and being able to, to fully embrace and value. You know, and people, everybody wants to see somebody like them in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, and so last year, 40% of our new hires were diverse. This year, we're 33% already. And that didn't happen by accident. I mean, it happened because we started concentrating on it, making sure that our pools were more diverse and we interviewed more people within a pool because the application process is not specific. I mean, a lot, you know, we've had several times where instead of interviewing five, we've interviewed 12 in order to make sure we had diverse candidates and it was a diverse candidate who got hired because he or she was not as well represented in their application materials as they could present themselves once we had a chance to talk to them. Uh, we didn't hire them because they were diverse. We hired them because when we got to know them, they were the best candidate. Uh, so our goal is to have much more diversity. And I think the more diverse we are, the more the better every other diverse person who comes into our environment is going to feel because they, they feel like we understand. Anything to add, Brad? I, I think well said. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I agree with all that. Okay. And, you know, one thing that I have seen across the state really quickly that I want to share is is employers partnering with community-based organizations for whom maybe have a relationship with the immigrant or refugee populations coming in or other populations um, that are diverse to what you have currently. Partnering with those organizations and then getting to know the, the individuals they work with, building a relationship can, can really help create a pathway that will be benefit to everybody involved. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrea. We are just about at time, yes. so. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you to our panelists. Great to, thank you for all of you who joined us in person and online. I also am gonna have Darby put in the chat, the partnerships event is coming up, our, our event page online. Let's continue the conversation. Uh, attracting, retaining, and keeping employees engaged in 2022, the Future Ready DSM webinar and high school apprenticeships, untapped talent webinar, returning citizens, those are all next week. So this is clearly an issue that we are, are continuing to have, want to continue to have, and, and hopefully are providing our members and investors a space to do that. So I'm going to pull up my quick last comments, and we'll, we'll get everyone out of here today. Uh, if you haven't already, be sure to register for that June 16th Public Policy Issue Forum. And then if you haven't, uh, let us know. We'd love to get you on our newsletter, either for those events that I mentioned or our public policy newsletter. I'll just give one more thanks to our panelists and moderator. And I hope the rest, all of you have a good rest of the day. Thanks for being here. <laughs>